Good morning, everybody. This is Ed Avest speaking. I'm the managing director of APDSP, and I welcome you all to uh, our webinar today on navigating away from price. Uh, our speaker today is Dave Bellman. Uh, Dave's a veteran sales trainer, uh, specifically in the printing industry, and he also has Reprographics clients. And he's the author of three books on the topic. Uh, and he has given presentations for us before and uh, many other printing related organizations. Uh, Dave really knows what he's talking about. Uh, and if you've read any of his columns in uh, APDSP today, I'm sure that you agree. Uh, during today's uh, webinar, if you have any questions, uh, please use the questions tab on your GoToWebinar screen and uh, send them to me. Uh, don't, you don't need to wait till the end. Go ahead and send them whenever they come to you and I will pass them on to Dave uh, when we get close to the end of his presentation. And if we run out of time, we will uh, answer the rest of them by email. Uh, lastly, this webinar is being recorded. So uh, if you want to listen to it again, uh, you'll have the opportunity to do that on the uh, APDSP member site. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn uh, over the screen to Dave. And he will take it from here. Okay. I want to add my welcome to uh, everybody. We're pleased to uh, have you here with us um, for some conversation about a topic that uh, that I know is uh, is very important to you. Um, price is an issue in our industry. It always has been. It always will be. But from very early in our uh, conversation today, I I want to plant the idea that it is maybe not as big an issue as you tend to think it is. I'll come back to that side again and again over the course of the next 45 minutes or an hour. For now, let's talk a little bit about navigation. It's the science of how we get from one place to another. And um, it's a process sort of approach to, uh, to a topic. How do you go about navigating? The first step is to figure out where you're going. The second step is, is to figure out how to get there, to plot your course to get there. Now, when you're plotting your, uh, your course on a road trip, you're, you're probably trying to plot the shortest course or, or the most interesting course or the most convenient course. Maybe without thinking about it, you're, you're trying to avoid any known hazards and trying to anticipate any um, unforeseen hazards. I know that uh, you can't always know where you're going to run into traffic, but you know those of us who drive up and down the same roads on a regular basis, we, we know where the problems are most likely to be. And if you do know that, it makes good sense to plot a course that, uh, that at least tries to avoid them. So you make your plan, and then you uh, depart. And, and, and it's important to remember that you put together a plan for a reason in the first place. The idea is to plan and then follow your plan. Plan your work, work your plan. I'm sure you've heard all of that before. And the hopeful result of all of this is you get where you're going and you get to celebrate whatever victory that involves. Now, let's come specifically to printing and our services and talk about where it is that we're trying to get to. The destination in this conversation is, in many cases, to win the order. But more than that, it's to win the order at your price, to get your price, to make money, to make a profit. But let's go a little bit deeper, a little bit further. Because I think that uh, your broader destination is to establish with every customer, with every prospect and customer, with everybody that you're selling to, or hoping to sell to, to establish that you bring value and that uh, you bring a lot of value and that you bring more value than any of their other options. Because the thing we know, one of the things we know is that uh, there's probably going to be a lower price 
But here's another thing we know. The lower price doesn't win every order. That's where we want to be. We want to win orders at higher prices, getting paid for the value that we bring. Now, before we go too far into some of the specific known hazards, I want to talk a little bit about pricing strategy in general. And you're probably used to this. Anytime we start a discussion of pricing strategy, there's a disclaimer. Uh, because it's against the law for a bunch of people like us to get together and set prices, we're not allowed to get together and say, hey, we're always going to charge this month. We're never going to charge less. That's illegal. We're not doing that. We're talking about strategy here. So let's talk about, well, let's talk about low price strategy. And let's accept the reality that if you want to sell at the lowest prices in the market, um, you damn well better have the lowest cost in the market. Otherwise, you have absolutely no chance of being profitable and successful. So let's consider this too. Do you really want to be the, uh, the, the cheapest printer in town? Is that the role that you want to establish for yourself? Now, it is true. Um, if you have the most modern, up-to-date equipment that uh, produces at the lowest unit cost, you can offer pretty low prices and still make some profit. On the other end of that spectrum, if, uh, if all of your equipment is paid for and, um, and you don't pay your employees very well, you, you can also offer really low prices and, and still make some profit. I just don't think that's who you want to be. I'm pretty sure there are printers who, uh, who, who want to be that printer. Um, or whether they want to or not, they operate like that printer. But here's something that I think I know. I think I know that uh, that the companies whose only semblance of a marketing plan is really cheap prices, they don't join the association. They don't take part in the webinars. They have they have really no interest in learning anything about the business because all they need to do is sell cheap and we'll get some business. Now that connects to the idea of market pricing and competitive pricing. And if you're in a typical market, you've got some low ballers in your market. You've got some people who sell cheap. If you are in a typical market, you also have some people who sell at, um, let's call it premium pricing. Hopefully that's you. And then, in a typical market, there's, a, there's, there's other people somewhere in, in the middle. The most important thing I want you to know about uh, competitive pricing is that competitive is not a point. Competitive is a range. On one hand, you really have to be in that competitive range to expect to, uh, to get much business. But on the other hand, isn't it true that we want to be able to sell at the high side of the competitive range, not at the low side all of the time? Here's something else I want you to consider. Just because somebody else says cheap, sells cheap doesn't mean you have to. Just because somebody else sells in the middle of the road doesn't mean that you have to. I'm going to come back to my overall philosophy on pricing in just a moment. Before we go there, though, let's uh, let's introduce the magic word into our conversation, value. Ultimately, people will buy from you at whatever your price is if they see value in your price. If they look at your price and say, yeah, this is a good price, this reflects value, I feel like I'm getting what I want, what I need at this price, and I'm happy with this price. Now, I think it's pretty well understood that printers have to provide value to their customers. I also think it's pretty well understood that um, value is connected to price in at least some way. But here's something that I'm not sure that uh, the printers spend enough time thinking about. Your customers have to provide value to you as well. The value you provide to them may be reflected as a 
competitive price, a fair price, um, quality that, uh, that reflects that price, service that reflects that price. But let's also consider that the value that, uh, that your customers provide to you um, has something to do with how easy they are to deal with, uh, but it mostly has to do with how profitable they are for you. Your most valuable customers are not necessarily the ones who give you the most business. I think they're the ones who contribute the most profit to your business. Now that takes us to my philosophy on pricing. Feldman says this. Feldman says you should not worry about what your competitors are charging. What you should do is you should set your prices where you want them to be, where you will make satisfactory profit. And then you should go looking for customers who think those prices are just fine. Are those customers out there? Let me tell you a story. I do a lot of coaching work. Um, I coach a bunch of sales managers at, at how to be more effective at that. Um, I coach a bunch of individual salespeople. And it's interesting that one of the first conversations I have when I take on a new uh, a sales coaching client, a new salesperson, is I ask them to tell me, what is it that, that, that's holding you back? You know, what is it that's keeping you from, from meeting your, your boss's uh, goals and expectations? By the way, um, some of the coaching I do is with new salespeople, working with them to, uh, to help them get off to a good start. I like that kind of work. I really enjoy being part of the process of uh, training somebody right. But a lot of the coaching work I do initiates, it starts with a call from a printer who says, I got this broken salesman, can you fix him or, or her? Um, I don't like working with those people quite as much, but those are the people I'm usually having this conversation with. I'm asking them. What is it that, that's keeping you from being successful? And more often than not, the answer is, you know, our prices. Our prices are out of whack in the marketplace. Our prices are too high. Now, when I hear that, I always do the same thing. I say to the salesperson, I said, what was, the, uh, what was your company's annual sales volume last year? Or what is, what is your company's annual sales volume trending at this year? And they usually don't know. Um, which, which I don't understand very much. I mean, I, I don't think, uh, I don't, I don't think your salespeople have any right to know how much profit you make, but I, I think they could know and should know how big your company is, what your volume is, or what your volume goals are company wide. Anyways, usually they don't know when I'm having this conversation. So I say, I say, go, go ask your boss and then call me back. Um, the last time I had this conversation was uh, eight or ten weeks ago, twelve weeks ago, it was about three months ago. And uh, the salesperson came back and he said, uh, "We did uh, 1.2 million dollars last year. We'll, we'll do about the same this year." So I said, "Okay, what does that say to you?" He said, uh, "I don't know what you mean. We did a million two. I said, "No, think about this. What does it mean that you did a million two? especially considering how we got to this conversation in the first place. He had no idea what I was getting at, so I eventually told him. What it means is that your pricing, your company's pricing, is just fine for $1.2 million worth of buyers. Go find me more buyers like those buyers. Don't tell me about the people who won't pay our price. Find people who will because they're out there. And they are out there, right? Don't you know that they're out there? I mean, if you're not the cheapest supplier in your area, but you still get some orders, you know that you can charge more than the cheap guys charge and still get some work. I think we want to be looking for the people, more people who think that, uh, that, that it's more about value than it is about crazy low prices. By the way, Here's another thought, and this bears on this conversation a little bit. Um, back in the middle of last year, I was speaking at a, uh, at a conference, and I was sitting around talking with half a dozen salespeople. This was not in the printing industry. 
Um, but I was sitting around talking with half a dozen salespeople, and, and they were talking about one of them said that um, I definitely lose more opportunity to uh, to price than anything else. And, and the rest of the group agreed. They started telling horror stories about, you know, at times when they quoted a fair price and somebody came in with a ridiculously low price and they didn't get the order. And then one of them says, so what do you think? Do you agree? I mean, are more opportunities lost to um, really low pricing than anything else? And I said, no, I don't think so. I will grant you that price is a thing for a lot of buyers. I will also grant you that, that price is a thing for a lot of salespeople, and I'm going to come back to that in our conversation in just a moment. But, but here's my observation. I spend a lot of time with an awful lot of salespeople. My observation is that more opportunities get lost to poor follow-up than anything else. I think more opportunities fall through the cracks for salespeople then get lost because of low pricing. And I want you to consider this. One of the elements of good follow-up is that you find out when you're in a price situation and you win yourself, you get yourself the opportunity to negotiate and do something about that. Just because somebody offers a lower price doesn't always mean that you're not going to get the job. We're going to talk about negotiations a little bit farther along. For now, let's get back to uh, some of the known hazards. Number one on the list is that your competitors are competing for your customers. Your competitors are calling on your customers, right? Trying to take them away from you. Now, the other side of that coin is that you are hopefully competing for their customers. But uh, let's keep in front of mind that we're competing for their good customers, not their bad customers. We're competing for the customers who pay their premium prices, their high range prices, not their lower prices. Now, it is true, and this is a known hazard, that some of your competitors sell at, at really low prices. It's also a consideration that some of their customers are price monsters. That's my term for people who buy on price who make all of their buying decisions based strictly and only on who offers them the lowest price. Now, question, are there price monsters in the marketplace? Answer, oh yeah, there definitely are. There are people who, who are absolutely positively about nothing but price. If we were live though, if we were all in the same room and I could ask you to, uh, to respond to a question, I would ask you, what percentage of all print buyers Specifically, our kind of print buyers. What percentage of our kind of print buyers do you think are really price monsters? And I would bet that uh, that your answers would be relatively low. I don't think any of you think that 100% of buyers buy on price. And I would tell you, I mean, my the, the point where I would start pushing back is 20%. I think that's the high end of the range for the number of people who really truly do buy on price. And what that means is that something in excess of 80% of all buyers buy on value, however they choose to define that. Now, I want to like take a little quick side trip here. And I want to ask you, does anybody have any bad customers? It, and I probably need to ask this question first. How do you define a bad customer? When I ask that question in live seminars, the answer often has something to do with uh, they don't pay their bills, um, they cause a lot of problem, they uh, they have unreasonable expectations. And, and that all sort of comes together in, in my definition of a bad customer, which to put it simply, I, I just say anybody who's more trouble than they're worth. Any customer who is more trouble than they're worth is a bad customer. So. That raises the question, what do you do with, uh, with bad customers? And the first thing that comes to mind for many people is, uh, well, you fire them. And it may come to that. But I want that to be plan B. Here's what I recommend as plan A. Give some thought to exactly what it is that makes them more trouble than they're worth. This is not something that you want to go into with a vague sense of, I don't like these people. Give some real thought to exactly what it is that causes problems for you and your team 
and then see if you can't set up a meeting with your bad customer. I've had a lot of these meetings, both with my own bad customers and my customers' bad customers over the years. And I always start those meetings out the same way. I always start out by saying, thank you for your business. And then I always continue by saying, we'd like to do even more business with you. But then I continue by saying that, um, you know, we have, I have, we have noticed that uh, when we do business together, it, it doesn't go smoothly all the time. And I was hoping, I say, that we could talk a little bit today about, about some of those things, those problems, those issues. I was hoping maybe we could talk and smooth out some of the rough edges that uh, that we've encountered over the years. And I've had lots of these conversations that ended with the customer saying thank you. I've had lots of these conversations that ended with the customer saying I'm sorry. I've had lots of these conversations that uh, ended with the customer changing their behavior. Here's the thing. There's only two reasons why somebody is going to be a bad customer where somebody is going to be more troubled than they were. One possibility is that they're jerks. The other possibility is that they're civilians. That's my term for people who don't have professional knowledge of our business, who don't know how to work properly with us. Now, if they're jerks, then you might have to fire them. But if they're civilians, their behavior could often be changed. You might be pleasantly surprised and how often you can turn a bad customer into a better customer just by talking with them. And you know, I have not found that you can always turn them from bad customers into perfect customers, but I bet you'll agree that better is better. Better is better. And think about this too. If you do have to fire a customer, um, don't do it, don't do it violently. Um, do it using economic forces. That's my preferred method. And what I mean by that is, is don't offer low prices to bad customers. Raise the prices that, that you quote to them. Because if you raise the prices high enough, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to get the message and go away, or else they'll pay your prices. And if you set the prices high enough, um, maybe you can use that strategy to get into balance in terms of you know, how much trouble they're worth. Ideally, we want every customer to be exactly as much or maybe exactly as little trouble as they are. Now, I want to continue and tell you another little story. I heard Seth Godin speak at an event, a conference uh, a couple of years ago. Seth Godin is a, uh, a prolific author and speaker on the subjects of marketing and sales. Also very funny. He's a good guy. He's a great speaker. Um, I heard him speak, and, and even though this event had nothing to do with the printing industry, he said, he said, the printing industry seems to be trying to convince me that I should only buy their products from whoever offers me the lowest price. Now, again, this was not a printing industry event. It was uh, actually Selling Power Magazine's um, sales leadership conference. I was one of the speakers. He was one of the speakers. I was excited about hearing him. I was probably a lot more excited about hearing him than he was about hearing me. But anyways, he made this comment about the printing industry, and then he just went on and continued uh, his presentation. I um, I got up and, and uh, met him at the bottom of the stage when he finished up, and I introduced myself, and I said, I'm a printing industry guy. Can, can you tell me? What did you mean when you said that, you know, that we're trying to convince you to buy our products at the lowest price? You said, well, I get a fair number of print salespeople calling on me. And they always say, I think I could save you some money in your printing. They always ask for the opportunity to quote on my next job. And they say, I think I can save you some money on your printing. And then he told me, I haven't group of printers that, that I've been working with for a long time. And I usually, you know, when I need something, I, I email the specs out to this group of uh, three, you know, three, four printers. So it's no big deal for me to send the specs out to uh, these other people. And I'm happy enough to give a guy a chance to give me a quote. And then he said to me, he said, by the way, how come they never seem to follow up? I mean, I bet you maybe half of, of these printers 
I invite them, that they ask for an opportunity to quote, I invite them to quote, um, they send me a quote and then they have to follow up. What's that all about, he said. And do you see how that takes us back to my thought, my observation that more opportunities get lost to, to poor follow-up than anything else? Anyways, now we're getting to the real fun part of my conversation with Seth Godin. He said when they do follow up, they always follow up the same way. They always call me up and they say, so how did my pricing look? And I tell them, he says, I'm not keeping any secrets. And, and usually I'm telling them your price is competitive. Um, it's not the lowest price I got. You're not going to win the order based on price alone. You were, you were competitive. And then he said, they always say, well, can I have another chance? Can I take another shot at this? Can I submit another quote? Can I sharpen up my pencil? Now, I'm not sure I believe him when he said that they always do that, that everybody always does that. But you know what? I know an awful lot of printing companies who operate that way. I know an awful lot of printing salespeople who operate that way. And all of them say to me, we're about value, we're not about price. All of them say to me, we're the best printer in the area. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to be the lowest price. All of them say stuff like that, but then they operate completely differently. So here's the thing. Print salespeople are telling me all the time that buyers are all about price. Print buyers are also telling me, though, that print salespeople and print companies are all about price. So I want you to make sure that you are navigating away from price and not leading with price. Think about the things that you do and you say that may reinforce the importance of price to the people that you're trying to sell to. And I am guessing that many of you on the line today are owners and managers of, of printing companies and, and you have salespeople out on the road working for you. I want you to think about, no, wait a minute, I want you to do more than think about it. I want you to find out if your salespeople are the ones that are doing all of the talking about price and, and therefore maybe undermining your profitability. I used to work for a guy many years ago, my first sales manager, in fact, was a guy named Fred Riccio. One of the things that Fred was fond of saying is that he who mentions price first loses. This was 35 years ago. There were a lot fewer women in the sales force than there are now. I think that if Fred were around today, he would not have been gender specific. I think he would have said he or she who mentions price first loses because I fear that an awful lot of us are doing it to ourselves. All right, two more known hazards. Let's talk about who your customers are. By the way, one of my positions is that you do not sell to companies, you sell to individuals. Your customers are not the companies, the organizations, they're the people within those companies who, who place orders with you. I use the word account to describe the company. And within any account, you can have multiple customers, right? In fact, isn't it true that you can have prospects and customers within an account? One of the potential customers is the purchasing department, the purchasing function, purchasing agents, purchasing managers, things like that. And I want you to consider that if you have an opportunity to sell to purchasing or you have an opportunity to sell to marketing, human resources, facilities management, others in the organization who might be considered the owners or originators of the print project, which of those categories is more likely to be a price monster? Is it the marketing manager who's counted on the stuff they're getting printed to do something for them? Or is it the purchasing person who probably sees his or her job as getting the lowest price? I know a lot of salespeople and a lot of companies do a lot of business with purchasing. I also know that sometimes in some companies, you've got to deal with purchasing or else. I mean, there's no opportunity to, to deal with the originators themselves. But I like to think of, of selling to purchasing as lazy selling. 
you know, being satisfied to deal in the price arena as opposed to getting yourself more into that value arena. Don't be satisfied with purchasing unless you have to. Don't let your salespeople be satisfied with purchasing unless you have to. And then, in spite of the fact that I know that, uh, that, that you folks probably do most of your business in the AEC community, um, and that, that you don't have a lot of experience with uh, nonprofits, you should know that industry-wide, um, an awful lot of printing companies of, of other types do an awful lot of business with nonprofits. I want to make sure that you guys know that there's different kinds of nonprofits and that, that affects their viability as, uh, as good customers. And one of the scale is the fundraising nonprofits. Here I'm talking about charities. Charities buy a lot of print, but they're very budget conscious. They're very cost conscious. The truth of the matter is, is that uh, a fundraising nonprofit, it's tough to be profitable selling to fundraising nonprofits. By the way, for what it's worth, I support the idea that fundraising nonprofits should buy cheap because if I give my money to a charity, I want the money to go to the cause, not to the printer, right? I bet you feel this, well, maybe you don't feel completely the same way, but big picture, maybe you'll agree with my perspective. Membership nonprofits are a slightly different situation. Um, this association is a membership nonprofit. And if you think about it, we got members, we want more members, and we want to keep the members that we have. How do you gain members and keep members by providing value, member services that provide value? Consider that an awful lot of that involves education, and an awful lot of that is connected to events. I have found that membership nonprofits can be really good customers for printing companies, and they tend to be less price desperate than the, uh, than the fundraising nonprofits do. But now we're coming to the area that I really want to talk about, artistic nonprofits. We're talking here about uh, museums, the, uh, the local uh, uh, symphony or ballet. Um, think about this. These artistic nonprofits, sell a quality product to an upscale market, they think quality is important. They think service is important, and their definition of value tends to be a lot more connected to quality and service than it does to lower prices. I work with a number of uh, quote-unquote reprographic printers who still do most of their business in the AEC community. I also work with uh, with some, maybe call them former reprographic printers. One of them calls himself a reformed reprographic printer, um, who are much more out in the uh, the quote unquote commercial world, the business world. Um, several of these are doing an awful lot of business with the local symphony or the ballet company, or especially the museums. There's a lot of large format color there. There's even a bunch of small format stuff there. I would suggest that those could be good markets for you. Now, coming back to the theme about not making it all about price, about navigating away from price. I want to talk about the first substantive conversation, which I define as the end of the prospecting stage, the beginning of the convincing stage, and the heart of the opportunity stage. What I'm really talking about here is when a salesperson gets that first opportunity to really sit down with a potential customer. This is a situation where far too many salespeople go in and show samples. They go in and they talk about their capabilities, they show samples, and they basically say, so do you need any of this kind of stuff? I want you and your salespeople to be having more of a conversation than a presentation at this stage. I want it to be questions, not statements, interrogatory, not declaratory. Now, I took part in a really good example of uh, this strategy a while back. See, I get this theory that a salesperson should structure this conversation over four different kinds of questions. Questions about the company, questions about the individual, 
questions about the products and then questions about the suppliers. I believe that, that this conversation be, should be structured around these kind of questions and in this specific order. Why? Well, because when we get to the end of this conversation, um, I need to ask a very important question. In fact, this conversation, in my experience, is really about one question. But it's not the kind of question that you can just walk in off the street and ask it and expect to get an honest, helpful, thoughtful answer. It's, it's the kind of question that, uh, that, that it works best if you can sort of build a mood. And the mood you're trying to build is when the person is comfortable talking with the salesperson and maybe even enjoying talking with the salesperson, which I think most buyers would tell you that, that they don't usually enjoy talking with salespeople. Anyway, I saw a great example with this. I was out making a call, a first appointment call with one of my clients. We were calling on the marketing manager for um, a regional chain of, uh, of bedding stores, bedding and mattresses and stuff. We go in and he starts off the conversation by saying, I spent some time doing research on your company. I've been to your website and, and, and I've seen your commercials and, and God knows I've seen your ads in the local paper for as long as I can remember. He said, one of the things that you stress is that you sell all of the major brands. And, and I wanted to ask you, can anybody sell all of the major brands or do you have to qualify in some way? Now, I wish you could have been there to see how the look on this this buyer's face, this marketing manager's face changed when he asked that, that question. Because I'm pretty sure what I took from her body language when we walked into her office is, all right, well, I agreed to meet with this salesperson and uh, the kind of day I'm having, I'd really rather not, but I'm committed to this, so let me see if I can't uh, make the best of it and make it as short as it could possibly be. She had sort of that look on her face she was expecting, no question, she was expecting a sales presentation. But instead, she got kind of an interesting question, wouldn't you think? And her whole demeanor changed, and she answered the question. She said, well, anybody, pretty much anybody can sell any of the range of brands, but they really like working with companies that, that know how to move the merchandise. And I was really proud of the salesperson because he picked up on that. And he, and he asked a follow up question, how do you do that? How do you, how do you show a Sealy or a Posturepedic, you know, that, that, that you're going to move their merchandise? And, and this woman now went off on a, on a, I don't know, lecture? <laughs> she, she spent the next six or eight or ten minutes telling us about all of the really cool marketing things that her company does to sell the product. She talked about the, their marketing strategy about their sales, about their online strategy. It, she was having a wonderful time telling us just how cool and how great a marketer she is. And, and we were listening and occasionally asking another follow-up question. And um, she was having a good time talking to us. In fact, she was having such a good time talking to us that um, that, that she was doing more talking than, than, than I think either of us wanted, keeping our, our – uh, our, our schedule in consideration. Anyway, you might find this amusing. I could tell watching my client that he was getting nervous about how much time she was taking. And, and he actually started leaning forward as we were getting like to eight or nine or 10 minutes. And then she came to a point where she stopped, you know, period, end of a sentence, intake of breath. And he jumped in with a, um, with a transitional question which also impressed me. He said to her, he said, how long have you been uh, working for this company? He transitioned from talking about the company to talking about the individual. And her answer was, I've been working here for uh, close to two years. His next question was, have you always been in this position or have you done other things within the company? Turned out that uh, she'd been hired as the marketing manager. She, she'd always been the marketing manager. But I was impressed by this, too, because he'd heard me, this salesperson had heard me tell a story before about how I asked the question to see if I could figure out, is this person 
empowered to make decisions to, to change suppliers? Would you agree, by the way, that uh, somebody who's very new at a job might not be ready to rock any boats, whereas somebody who's been on the job a long time is, is, is probably empowered? I always felt that way. But but I told the salesperson the story about uh, the time I made a classic mistake by asking a buyer how long you know you've been with the company and he told me uh, like 15 years or something like that and then I went blithely along my way assuming that I had the right guy I later found out that uh, he'd been with a company for 15 years 14 years and 11 months working at back running a machine and then all of a sudden they promoted him into a position where he was buying stuff. It turned out that, uh, that that I made a fundamental error there. But now think about how cool this is. You're asking what is basically a selfish question. How long have you been with the company? Have you always done this? Have you had other positions? That's really a selfish question because you're really trying to figure out, does this person have the authority to buy from me? But you're sort of positioning that question in, in terms of, it's something that I think sounds kind of like real interest in that real person. By the way, have you noticed that we haven't said anything about price yet? And we're not going to. We're going to move on from here and, and talk about the product. I mean, I want ultimately to learn what this company buys. Um, I want to make sure that they do, in fact, buy what I sell and buy enough of it to make pursuing them worthwhile. I do want to learn all of that stuff in this conversation. But I'm not coming here to ask for something to quote on. I'm not going to be like those guys who are calling on Seth Godin and asking for a chance to quote on his next project. I'm not going to be the one who's talking about price. I'm not looking to put myself into a situation where it's all about price. What I'm really looking for, and this takes us now to the uh, the one question that this conversation is all about. I want to ask, and by the way, th this is, I hope that, uh, that you picked up that this time I'm talking about a prospecting situation. We're going to come back in a moment and talk about uh, talking with, with current customers. This is a prospecting question, and I know that they're buying from somebody else now. So I want to find out about that somebody else and more than anything else, I want to see if there's any weakness in their relationship with somebody else. The question I like to ask is, knowing that, that you are doing business with, uh, with one of my competitors or, or some of my competitors at this point, I just want to ask you this, is there anything you would change if you could about the way that you buy from them, about the way that they sell to you, about the quality, about the service, about anything? Do you have any issues? With, with your status quo. That's what this meeting is all about. I see too many salespeople who go in to make a presentation. All right, so you can go in and make a presentation. And I see too many salespeople who, who they're really all about it. You got something I can quote on, even if it isn't anything you need right now. Have you got anything that I can quote on so you know I can show you how great our prices are? That's not the kind of selling that, uh, that I want you to be involved with. And I also want you to see that this conversation is preparing us for the price obstacle objection that's probably coming later on. Let me come back to that idea in just a moment. I really like the idea that um, you think in terms of, of two conversations in your prospecting. The first so standard conversation is the one where you learn about them. The second substantive conversation is the one where you tell them about you. That may be in the form of a proposal where you're basically trying to outline the value that you think you'll bring. It's not necessarily connected to a specific quote or a specific order. It may be just in general terms. Thank you for talking with me. I appreciate what I've learned from you. Now let me tell you what I think I can bring to your party. And it's important to me that you don't try and close the sale by making your pitch and then asking for the order. 
Think about the process of uh, presenting a proposal. And think about a proposal that, that includes a number of different documents. Think about a proposal that includes uh, samples of your work. Think about a proposal that, um, that includes testimonials from, uh, from current clients. Think about a proposal that includes uh, bios and photos of, 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 of your team, the people on your team. Um, think about a proposal that includes a, a description of your quality control procedures. And thinking about a proposal, thinking about a proposal that involves dealing with each of those things one at a time, and before moving on to the next thing, asking, so what do you think? How are we doing so far? Does that make sense to you? Does that sound like value to you? And now think about this. And, and let's turn this from a general proposal to a specific proposal where whether you asked for it or not, the first meeting resulted in the opportunity to actually compete for a real job. Think about showing your various documents and working your way to the price as opposed to walking in, sitting down and showing somebody your price. Unfortunately, this is what I see far too often. Salespeople leading with price and then oftentimes putting them in a situation where they're going to have to be defensive. Which of these approaches would make more sense to you? Laying out a foundation of value and then showing your mere price, or showing your price and then and then hoping that you get the chance to talk about the value you think is contained in it. There's a couple of quick thoughts about customer conversations with current customers, the kind of situation where you're talking about an actual project where a customer says, "Hey." I need something, you know, let's uh, come on out here and uh, let's, talk about, uh, let's talk about my next project. Obviously, you need to get all the specifications, right? Because if you don't have the specifications, then, then you can't give an accurate quote. But I also hope that you and your salespeople are the kind of consultative salespeople who go into the intent of uh, what it is that they're hoping to buy. I bet you'll agree that anything that anybody orders, any print job that anybody orders is, is intended to do something for them. It has a purpose, right? The printing has a purpose. And, and I hope you will agree that there is potential in many print jobs that, uh, that you could do something to adjust them, something different that would make it work better than, than what the buyer originally had in mind. Well, I'll tell you what, when I talk to buyers, they tell me that that represents value to them. Many print buyers know what they've done in the past. Sometimes they even know whether it worked or not. Sometimes they don't. But I found that many print buyers are open to something that might work better in the future. And then the other thing that, that you and your salespeople should always be asking about is um, Whiskey Charlie Sierra. Um, I'm a pilot. We talked like that. We used the uh, phonetic alphabet going back to the days when uh, radio communication was not as good, as clear as it likely is today. Whiskey Charlie Sierra um, stands for WCS, uh, which stands for worst case scenario. I always want to ask my customers about any project that I might be quoting for them. What could go wrong with this project? Is there anything about this project that uh, that would scare you, that would keep you up late the night before it's due to be delivered? Um, and if that happened, how badly would that hurt? All of this, all of this is an expectation that at some point somebody's going to complain about the price. Wouldn't you agree? That, um, that you're often running into buyers who, who raise objections, who raise obstacles. I mean, it's great, isn't it, when you quote your price and they just give you the order? We like that, especially if we're pricing our work high enough. 
But I'm telling you that it's not, it's not to be unexpected that you're going to be invited to negotiate. Now, key word here, invited to negotiate. I know an awful lot of salespeople, an awful lot of printers who think that having to negotiate is a bad thing. It's the worst thing in the world. I don't think so at all. Although, I will tell you this, I've learned over the years that I have a different, nego- uh, different definition of negotiation than many people seem to. Many buyers in particular seem to think that, that negotiation is defined as they complain about the price, so we lower it. That, that's not how I define negotiation. I define negotiation as my opportunity to defend the price that I have quoted. And I also believe that when a negotiation begins, there's actually three things that are up for negotiation. And those three things are value, cost, and price. And importantly, this is exactly the order in which you should approach any negotiation situation you find yourself in. Plan A should always be to attempt to negotiate value. And negotiate value is all about simply telling them why you think they should buy from you anyway, even if your price is higher. All right, why is that? Well, When I ask that question in live seminars, when I ask that question of salespeople, they like to say, well, you'll get better quality from me, which could be good justification if quality is an issue to the buyer. Same thing with service. Same thing with reliability. You may produce the best quality printing in your market area, but if they're completely happy with the quality they're getting, why should they pay more to get different quality, better quality from you? See, this is why I'm asking those questions. This is why I want to know if there's anything that would keep a current customer up, you know, up late the night before the delivery. This is why I want to know if my prospects would change anything about their status quo if they could. Because what I really want to be able to say when it comes down to negotiating value is I want to be able to say, do you remember those questions that I asked you about uh, problems, risk, pain, stuff like that? I considered your answers in calculating my price. And, And here's what I think I'm saying to you. Yeah, there are people who would do this for less but, but based on what you've told me you want, based on what you've told me you need, I think my price is the lowest price that, that, that you can pay and, and be sure that you're going to get what you want, that you're going to get what you need. Basically, you're telling people, I think I understand you, and, and I think this is the best value. It may not be the lowest price, but I think it's the best value. Now, Here's something I've observed. I've observed that if you will embrace this strategy, and by the way, be good at it, if you will embrace and learn how to do this well, you're gonna find there's only three ways in which people can respond. One of them, and this has happened to me many times in my own career, I have plenty of times when people have said to me, okay, that makes sense, I understand. I've even had people say to me, yeah, I get it, I bought shape, but I got what I paid for. All right, here's the order, thank you. I bet you'll agree that getting the price at your, getting the order at your price is a victory for you, right? Second possibility, and again, this is something that has happened to me many times in my career. I've had many situations where I've explained to people patiently and carefully and logically why I thought they needed to pay my price to get what, what they, they told me they wanted they need. And they basically giggle and say, okay, it was worth a try. Here's something I need you to know. They go to buyer school. We're here doing sales school today. They do buyer school as well. What they teach you in buyer school is that you can almost always intimidate a salesperson or a whole printing company into lowering the price. All you usually have to do is to threaten and not buy whatever it is they're trying to sell it to you at the price they're trying to sell it to you at. Most salespeople start backing up immediately at the first hint of a price objection. I don't want you to do that. And, and I hope you would feel stupid if you found out later on that um, you could have got your price if you'd made an attempt to defend your price. All right. 
One possibility is that you win the order based on value. The other is that you win the order because you defeat them in negotiations. Third possibility, and again, this has happened many times to me, is they say, yeah, that's all very interesting when your price is still too high. All right. Sometimes negotiating value doesn't work, but that's okay because that just means we're going to plan B. Plan B is negotiating costs. Plan B is all about the application of product knowledge to suggest a less expensive option. And in this regard, a successful cost negotiation reduces price while preserving your profit margin. That makes it a good thing. It also, by the way, reduces price while preserving your pricing integrity. Think about this. If you say I'll sell it to you for $100 and I say that's too much, and you say, well, all right, will you buy it from me for $90? Should I trust you in the future when you quote me a price or, or tell me anything else? I think it's important that any price reduction is accompanied by a cost reduction so that, so that you're not, you, you don't look like you were gouging them the first time. And by the way, I often find, I have often found in my career that a price objection was really not a price objection. It was a cost objection. It was a budget objection. Sometimes you don't get to that till this stage in the negotiation, but that's okay. That can be what plan B is all about. The good news is sometimes plan A doesn't work, but plan B does. The bad news is that sometimes plan B doesn't work either. All right. That takes us to plan C, negotiating price. Negotiating price is, is just all about getting something in return for everything that you give up. Winning the order might qualify. You know, and I would never say to you that you should never lower a price to get an order. I would, by the way, say to you that never do it as plan A or plan B. Do you see the wisdom in not giving up a price until you've tried at least the first two opportunities? All right. Sometimes the, the, the price concession you have to make is not that bad a deal for you. I got no problem with lowering the price if it is a good business decision. Let's just make sure that it is a good business decision. And if you can get something else in return, I was in a situation not too long ago where um, my customer got an additional week to turn an order around, which had some value to my customer. Um, I've been in situations where people got testimonials in return for reducing a price, referrals in return for reducing a price, the promise for more work in return for reducing a price. All of that is possibility. So now, my closing thoughts for today. Most sellers, most sellers are pretty weak when it comes to price. Most sellers' idea of negotiation ends up with lowering the price, just like most buyers. If you're weak as a seller, that just makes the buyer strong. So I'm hoping that we can make sure that, uh, that Mr. Gold, Seth Golden is talking about somebody else in terms of uh, the printers that are trying to sell to him. Let's not be the ones who lead off with price. Let's not be the ones who reinforce the idea that, uh, that, yeah, price is important. You should find somebody who will sell it to you cheap. Let's establish the foundation of value. Let's defend our value. And let's see if we can't uh, be more successful in that regard than some of our competitors. One final thought. Um, if you like the way I think and, and you want more of it or you want your salespeople to be exposed to my thoughts on uh, pricing and other issues, prospecting and other issues, time management and other issues, I've written a book called Sell More Printing. I've sold an awful lot of copies at uh, $65, which probably sounds like a lot of money, but consider the value of a book that's written specifically about selling printing. Anyways, I'm happy to offer a special price, and if you want to Send me an email. Um, I'll send you a link to uh, my website where you can do that. Or you can just copy the web address at the bottom of, uh, of this particular page. I didn't see any questions, uh, Ed. I have a couple questions. I have a couple questions. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, all right. First, let me say thank you, Dave. Uh, that was wonderful information. I appreciate it, and I know our audience did too. Uh, we're just about out of time, but let me let me go ahead and put these questions to you quickly, Dave. And if you uh, can answer them quickly, that's great. If not, we can do them via email to the to the requesters here. Uh, the first question okay. is: uh, Don't you have to ask pain questions? especially when new prospects call you for a quote. For example, did someone tell them they needed three quotes, so that's why they called you? Or do they really have issues with their current print provider? What's your feeling on that? Well, that, I, I'm absolutely with them on the idea of asking pain questions. That's really what I'm talking about. The, the question about is there anything you would change if you could? That's a pain question. And what would cause pain? What would cause problems? Again, that's a pain question. Um, I would stay away from the question about are you calling me just because you were told to get three quotes. Okay, thank you. Um, another question was if we are already a low price seller in our market, can we stop doing that? Is there some way to change our reputation for that? Absolutely. The step I would recommend is to uh, just start quoting higher prices immediately. Um, and I would say work your way into this. If, if you can, add a 2% kicker into your pricing uh, uh, estimating package. Just move the price up by some small percentage and, and keep doing that I mean, on a monthly or quarterly basis. Keep raising the prices. Um, until somebody, until people really start pushing back. In terms of the, if, if I'm hearing a reputation question, if you have a reputation as the low price supplier um, and people will come to you because of that, but you raise your prices to the point where, where you really are profitable, that's the best of both worlds. I wouldn't worry too much about the perception, I just worry about the actuality. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question that uh, I can answer, and that is, uh, is the webinar going to be available for others to watch later? Uh, yes, the webinar will be posted uh, in the members section of the APDSP website. So I'll send a link out to that uh, when it's posted. Um, if, you, if anyone has other questions that they would like to ask, we are out of time but feel free to email them to me. Uh, my email is ed.avis at apdsp.org. Uh, and uh, I will get them to Dave and we'll get your answers to you. We, we welcome those questions. Uh, just in closing, uh, let me thank you again, Dave, for your, your time today and your knowledge. It's, it's been greatly appreciated. APDSP has other educational opportunities uh, coming very soon, and so please uh, uh, note these. Um, first, we have three other webinars scheduled for this year, one per quarter. You can learn about those on our website. Uh, we are taking a group to Germany to attend their conference in May, and that is always a very interesting event uh, where there's education and networking and good socializing and, and good beer drinking. So I recommend you check that out. There's also a brief article about that on our website. And lastly, please uh, put on your calendar uh, that uh, APDSP's convention, annual convention, will be again in conjunction with SGIA. Uh, that will be in the fall, in October, in Dallas this year. And we'd love to see you there. So thank you, everybody, very much for your time today and for attending. And uh, stay tuned uh, for when this webinar is posted. And I hope that we see you uh, at other events of APDSB soon. Thank you. And this, uh, this webinar has now ended.